My name is Judith Johnson. Uh, I'm currently serving as the uh, interim superintendent for the city of Mount Vernon Schools, but I bring to this testimony, to this commission, and to the audience 40 years of experience, both in the area of superintendent services as well as working for the U.S. Department of Education. I'm very aware that red light, and as I watch people speak, if you look at my notes, I keep crossing out paragraphs. <laughs> So I'm going to go quickly to the recommendations, but I can't do that without first referencing what I consider to be the most significant issue that we face. And that is the issue of poverty. I speak about that potential because it remains untapped. Our kids who live in poverty are not being well educated in the state of New York. We are confronted in Mount Vernon, one of 27 of the small cities in the state of New York. We educate more poor kids, 1.3 million, than kids who come from high income families, just a million. So allow me to borrow a theme from uh, Thomas Friedman's September 2nd op-ed piece titled, It's Halftime in America. Think about it as a metaphor for what we face. Today, the most recent statistics tell us that four of every 10 poor children whose families are at the bottom fifth of incomes in our country will end there as adults. They may never escape poverty. Thus, the halftime for us is to address the growing evidence of racial and economic disparities in educational systems that diminish efforts to sustain a robust economy and educated citizenry. Friedman points out that every American must be equipped with the tools essential for preparing for some form of post-secondary education, whether it's a vocational school, a community college, or a four-year college. That goal is based on the premise that we prepare every New Yorker with work-ready skills for one of today's jobs, prepare them to be lifelong learners for one of tomorrow's yet undefined jobs. Now in the written testimony, we give you lots of data that illustrate the challenges of poverty and performance, but I will not go through the data, except to offer the following. The gap between high wealth districts in Westchester and Mount Vernon schools, the per pupil gap is 21 thousand dollars per child. So what are some of the recommendations that we come up right to my conclusions? The first step I would ask of you as a commission is to please do this for, do this for the superintendents. Resist the urge to impose another unfunded or underfunded mandate on our schools. A mandate requires the reallocation of existing dollars and staff resources. Resist it. Take a look at the issue of fiscal equity. Today's finance systems were never designed to support such uniformly high levels of student learning, particularly when the task calls for closing the achievement gap and making the greatest gains with students who've been underserved. So for the parents in Mount Vernon, for the parents in the 27 small cities, we ask that you strengthen the targeting of education aid to high need, low wealth districts, as was enacted in 2007. <coughs> and resume funding of the phase-in provisions of foundation aid, at least for the districts like ours that are not reaching the definition of a successful school district. In Mount Vernon, the parents have to decide whether their educational, whether their property tax dollars will pay for schools through school tax or pay their rent or their mortgage. Freeze the charter school tuition until the legislation is passed to set aside a separate funding for charters. One imagines that this notion of the money following the child is meant to punish the sending school district for a student's departure. But the real recipient of the punishment is a child who remains in the public schools. A child may leave, but the infrastructure and human resources remain intact. There are significant fiscal pressures on districts from growth and charter schools and allow public schools access to the same flexibility offered to charter schools, level the playing field. I'm going to skip the references to the Harvard Business Review, but I do want to point this out. Eric Hanischuk developed a new way for examining the link between a country's GDP and the academic test scores of its children. He found that one country's scores were only half a standard deviation higher than another in 1960. The GDP grew a full percentage point, faster in every subsequent year through 2000. The report's authors call this gap the economic equivalent of a permanent national recession. So we're not investing enough in science, technology, and math, and let me take you to what we think we need to be doing with our classrooms. 
The world that our children live in today is a technology-based world. The nature of their environment is characterized by multimedia, addictive games, mobile access. Yes. Okay. Recommendations as opposed to Okay. We don't spend. I'll, I'll do that. Um, let me just try to figure out where to take this. We talk about operating school as a base camp, a design hub for learning, moving students by what they know, not by age, and providing credit for project-based learning. I'll take you to the last one. Introduce career paths into our secondary education programs. Allow students after two years of high school, age 16, into career and vocational programs that provide both a high school diploma and a post-secondary degree. degree. The program should focus on work readiness for the current workforce and the concept of continuous learning for tomorrow's jobs. And fund and mandate full-day pre-kindergarten for all children, especially those in high poverty schools, so they can enter high school with the literacy skills that they need to be successful. I apologize for the